Maybe if I don't touch my computer, it'll work. Don't change things. Don't change things, exactly. Make things boring, as boring as possible. That's what it's gonna, this talk is going to be about, so thank you. That was an excellent introduction. Uh, not introduction, but an excellent coverage of how you should be monitoring and alerting on your data pipelines and everything else on your system. So I've been doing data pipelines with Python now for about nine years, which is about as long as I've been writing Python. And I remember some very bad days at the Washington Post, which is where I first got a chance to write Python in production, where I took down the kid and server many times. Um, <laughs> it was sadly not boring. It was very exciting. So that was bad. But uh, I was writing these Python scripts to ingest things like school data or census data and take them and use, you know, pipeline them to production. And these were pretty scrappy Python days at the Washington Post. We were running Django 9.6, it was a good time. And we also were breaking things very often. And our pipelines were these Python scripts that were basically wrapped together with hopes and dreams and not necessarily a lot of testing or automation. And that was really bad. Uh, I, since then, I've had a chance to work with some of the larger pipeline frameworks such as Hadoop and some of the JVM stack things. And outside from having to work in the JVM, that was fine. Uh, and then since now, we're kind of having this pipeline renaissance in Python. And it goes very much with PyData and everything that's happening in the quote unquote big data world with Python. But the really nice thing is Python's becoming kind of a first level language for most of these data pipeline frameworks. So you can now do really large scale data pipelines as well as small scale data pipelines with Python without doing jumping jacks and uh, somersaults to get it done. So that's a little bit about what we'll be covering today. A little bit about me. Again, I've been doing Python now for nine years. I am a data scientist and a data engineer now. I come from more of a software engineering background, but I found the data problems to be the most interesting, so I decided to focus on them. And I run a company, Kayamastan, out of Berlin, Germany. Uh, and thanks again, Miro, for ensuring that I got here yesterday. It was uh, 14 hours of fun. So. Who needs a data pipeline anyway? You might be asking yourself, yeah, I have a series of scripts or I have some database that we use. There's absolutely no need for me to have a data pipeline. And how many might fit into that category? Just, okay. And how many people already have a data pipeline and are bored by this slide? <laughs> okay, just getting an idea. So I, I agree. I mean, um, I'm not really an artist. As I said, I do most of my free time doing cooking and things, but I decided to draw some graphics for us because uh, I also use Linux, so I can't use Photoshop. So anyways, uh, here is me, and this is my normal development cycle when I'm like, oh, I have this new idea, I want to try it out. Uh, that's me writing my Python script on my computer, and then I'm get pushing it up to my servers or have some sort of deployment architecture with the Ansible and so forth. And then it's there running in the cloud, and maybe it's on cron tab or something. And uh, potentially that works. And at the end, it emails me and it says, hey, I finished and here's the data that I sent you. And that's great. That works for a lot of things. I actually have probably more VMs doing this than I should admit. But uh, then sometimes you have this problem. So I'll give you a moment to read. And I have this common problem. Uh, my cron is failing and it's like, hey, you have 30 new messages. Uh, whatever, I'll get to it later. Maybe I even set up my mail too and I'm like, oh yeah, I should check that script. Why is it not working anymore? Or maybe I'm getting an old security alert and I'm like, hmm, yeah, maybe I should upgrade my server security. These are all things that you should be doing, right? And these are problems and maybe one reason why you actually need a data pipeline rather than just running a few scripts on cron every few hours. So a few more reasons about why to use pipelines. So if you're handling data and you're managing data, there's a lot of problems that can happen. And again, 
like Michal said, we try to make things as boring as possible. So use a framework to do the hard stuff, right? Most of these data pipeline frameworks, they have built-in state handling and they have item potency. And this allows you to not think about, oops, did I run it once or did I run it twice and am I gonna end up with duplicate data? It already manages all of that for you. That's not, some, that's not a problem that you wanna try to fix yourself unless it's a core competency of your product. Upstream and downstream failure handling. So you need to know when you're building these pipelines, did something fail at the beginning of the pipeline, in the middle or the end? and where can you then pick up from that failure point? Most often it's failing because somebody deployed a bug, right? Like we are the biggest, software developers are the biggest problem when it comes to systems. So a lot of times you need to locate where that bug is, who's responsible, and let them know that they need to run the test suite more often, or write new tests, right? Uh, it should be scalable, right? And this is again something that maybe you shouldn't have to do, especially if you're more of a data-focused person. You shouldn't be sitting there thinking, how do I scale this? How do I parallelize this? Outside of just the common distributed computing problems you may need to solve with your code. And then finally, you need monitoring and debugging. So a lot of times, if you're doing this on your own, you might say like, okay, well, what should we monitor? Maybe we monitor whether the server goes down, maybe we monitor error logs, but maybe you also need to monitor memory usage, maybe you need to monitor dead or failed processes, you likely need to monitor the network because you're sending large amounts of data across the network, and if the network gets congested and goes down, that can break your pipeline. So these are all things that you should be monitoring, and this is a lot of things that these frameworks can at least help you get started with. And finally, you should not be writing bespoke code for everything. Focus on what your product actually is or what your company does or what you actually want to do. Don't focus on building a bunch of infrastructure with code when somebody's already done the hard bits for you. So a little bit, how many people here are familiar with graph analysis and graph theory? Sweet. Okay, so you already know about DAGs, and most of these pipeline frameworks operate with DAGs, which are directed acyclic graphs, and they allow us to, again, have that item potency, and they allow us to also distribute well, right, because um, we can usually parallelize them. And for this reason, DAGs are really awesome, and they have great properties, and we should use them in our frameworks and our pipelines more often. If you wanna talk more about DAGs and graphs, I will be around later. Okay, so Python pipelines, what are my options? There's a bunch of different frameworks, as I referred to, so we'll go through them. And again, I am not an artist, and I hope that this is somewhat readable. I wanted to show everything from simple to complex. So we have kind of the singular organism on the left to the very complex universe on the right. And in the very simple side, we have something like Celery. And Celery should be boring. It should not be interesting. You set it up, it distributes to your workers, it distributes your work by having a distributed queue. Things pick things up. Potentially you have a few dependencies with, uh, they allow you to essentially build subtasks. And it just computes with Python all of your work. That is really easy. And that honestly covers probably 95% of the data pipeline work that you need to do. So again, if you're, just, if you're already using Celery to do this, it's probably good enough. You might wanna build some extra tests and some extra checks, but it's already doing quite a lot of good work. Next, we have Dask, and Dask is a out-of-core memory distributed data framework. And basically what that means is it can help build these graphs so that it can analyze the data in parallel for you. This is great particularly if you have really large data sets and you want to distribute them across a cluster and do analysis on them. But what Dask also does is it allows you to build a series of tasks that you can run your data through. So aside from doing out of core memory or doing graph processing on large scale data sets, it can also do this type of uh, have task A run to task B, and then distribute, parallelize that across the cluster, and then aggregate in task C. So like a simple map reduce. The one thing that DAS doesn't have is it doesn't have a lot of monitoring, and it doesn't have scheduling. So again, it's on the simple end of things. 
Maybe if you use Dask, you can use it with one of the larger frameworks if you need resiliency. Then we get to a larger framework like Luigi and Airflow, and I'll be going further into depth and showing you some examples of that. But Luigi and Airflow you know, have kind of the goods. They're the big Python data pipelines. And they allow you to have schedulers, they allow you to have workers, and they're going to do some state handling for you and maintain a status database. And finally, at the very end, you have stream processing, and a lot of these real-time stream processing frameworks, we're gonna talk a little bit about them, but they're usually honestly written in Java or C++, and then they have Python bindings. So this is another way that you can use Python to interact with them, but they handle some more difficult use cases, such as determining watermarks, windows, how do you deal with inflow and outflow problems, such as, yeah, uh, acts, so when do you acknowledge that data has been received or transmitted across your network? How do you ensure that task failure is properly handled? And how do you deal with things like a backlog? So first we're gonna talk about Airbnb's Airflow. And too often I hear from people, ah, I, I built my pipeline in something else, and if I had to rebuild it today, I'd use Airflow. And so that, for that reason, I think everybody should be at least talking about it and potentially looking at it as a solution. So it was developed originally by Airbnb, primarily between the data engineering team and the data science team. And they both wanted to work with Python and they were kind of sick of building everything in Apache Storm and Apache Hadoop and so forth. So they were like, okay, we can solve this problem with Python. And they built up this really great framework. It's actually incubating at Apache right now, and I would be very surprised if it didn't successfully graduate to a full Apache project. But it allows you to have a built-in scheduler. So it manages all of those cron type of things for you. Surprising fact is that the scheduler is written in Celery. So again, keep it simple. It has a state database, so it's going to maintain those states for you. It's going to maintain the dependency states of all of your graphs as you build them. Each task is a function, so if you already have a bunch of scripts, then it's really easy to import them into Airflow and get them working. And you can build them via a simple wrapper. So I'm going to show you really quickly some examples. So I'm gonna show a quick example of what this looks like, if it can go over well. We're just gonna look, I will be posting all of this code, um, so no need to worry about it too much. But essentially, you here are building a DAG. So it's really simple, you're passing in some parameters, you're building a very simple DAG, you have a series of functions. These are just simple Python functions with ins and outs, nothing special. And when we go to the bottom, we see that we have Python operators. So there's SQL operators, there's CSV operators, there's Python operators, there's bash operators. So these are all things that you can call. And you're just simply building and adding them to the same DAG, which is your pipeline here. And then at the end, you're setting downstream. Then Airflow knows what to do. So let me, let me move this. Sorry, where's my mouse? Okay, so Airflow. Mm, there we go. So Airflow will then give you this nice scheduler interface. So it has a bunch of different things built into the Airflow CLI, but one of them is having this scheduler run. And this is kind of command central, so to speak. So if you're running a cluster, this is usually on one machine that has, of course, network access to all of the other machines. And you can look through. It comes with all of these examples. So if you just want to install Airflow and play around with some example DAGs, you can do so. But I also have my ones running here on their schedule. And we can see the different success and failure states. And when there is failures, because there will be, we try to make them boring. You can look at the failure. You can see how many times it's failed. This is all, again, in your state database. And finally, you can look at the log of the error. So you don't even have to log into your distributed cluster. 
you can see, okay, I'm having SMTP authentication errors. I should go fix wherever my configuration or environment variables are set. So pretty clear. Uh, there's also the ability to quickly look at your graphs, right? So this is great for people that, yeah, are joining your team and you need documentation on your data pipeline. This is a great way to do so. It is somewhat auto-documenting, which is nice. Again, I'll be posting all of the code. So beyond Airflow, there's also Spotify's Luigi. So Spotify's Luigi was built with Hadoop integration in mind. If you're already using Hadoop or HDFS, then it's a great choice. If you're not using Yarn, Hadoop, Mesos, HDFS, it's probably honestly overkill and doesn't have as many nice features that you might want. Again, you have to cron or self-start your tasks with Luigi. So unlike Airflow, which is going to do them for you via Celery, you need to manage how tasks are run with Luigi. Luigi will just handle the state and the dependency issues. It, again, maintains state with input and output tests. And this can be great, because it's going to run through and say, oh, okay, this task is finished. We can move on beyond this point, and we know to retry from this point. That's great if your pipeline properly functions and throws exceptions every single time you could possibly write bad data. But if, say, you end up writing bad data somewhere, uh, Luigi will just say, oh, the file's there. Let's keep going. So this accentuates the point that you need to have data validation or data testing somewhere in your pipeline that you're not depending on a framework for. Or you need to actually throw exceptions every time you have a data validation issue. And tasks are classes. So it's a little bit more task or, or class oriented for those of you that really love, uh, that love uh, doing more object oriented programming. I don't know why my, okay, so this is an example. I tried to build something that was as similar to the Airflow example so that you can have a good side by side comparison between Luigi and Airflow. You can see that we're inheriting from the task object. We have a few parameters that are used as attributes, and those can be passed either by the command line or they're passed uh, via inheritance uh, from a previous task. And if we go to the bottom, then we can see that we have a requires element. That is a method that you can call on your classes, and that will require upstream tasks. And we usually have also some output and input options. So these are going to also define the way that your pipeline interconnects. Let me see. Oops. Nope. Uh, so we can also, I'm sorry, I keep losing my mouse. And Look at the visualization. So here is the Luigi task visualizer, which is a little bit like the Airflow backend. We can see when we have upstream and downstream failures, and we can still visualize our graphs, for example, via this or SVG as well. And if we have failures, we can look again at the exceptions. So I wanted to show a little bit of exception handling because most of the time that's what you're doing when you're interacting with these. It's a little bit less self-documenting because uh, Airflow has the ability to also look at all of the code for each, but you can do things like monitor your workers and look at your resources. Then moving on to the most complex, we have real-time and stream processors. So this is again where we're usually starting to move into the Java space and we are using Python wrappers to interact with Java. So how many people here have interacted with Apache Spark? Had the pleasure of working with Apache Spark. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great project, and I'm not going to uh, deny that they've put a lot of effort and thought into it, but uh, there are some issues sometimes with doing batch work on a distributed data set. So Apache Spark will allow you to do batch programming on a distributed data set. They have a streaming interface, which is essentially just micro-batching, so it's just batching on smaller windows. 
Um, but they have, they have treated Python as a first-class language, and their Python API basically mirrors their Scala API, and so that's really great. Apache Flink is a really impressive project out of Berlin. Uh, it's still primarily Java-based, but they do have a Python API wrapper that you can use. Uh, the Python API wrapper is indeed lacking, but the really neat thing about Flink is they're trying to do some interesting things with distributed snapshots, and that's going to help move them forward, really, I think, and progress the way that checkpoints are saved in these distributed systems. There's Google Dataflow, which used to be Apache Beam, so Apache Beam is still also a project, and you can use Python with Apache Beam. But Google Dataflow allows you, if you're already in the Google Cloud infrastructure, to write, say, 20, 30 lines of Python code and maintain a large-scale pipeline in the Google Cloud. And they're actually doing an amazing bit of research around how do you determine when something's done. Um, with a lot of these MapReduce tasks or with larger scale pipelines, we have this problem with stragglers, and it basically means either we have a skewed data set, we chose an inappropriate key, or perhaps we just have one particular bit of our code that's running too long on certain boxes. And for this reason, we need to think about this straggler problem. And the Google Dataflow Solutions allows you to do things like auto-provision for handling stragglers, and allows you to do things like say, this task is fine once it's 95% complete. So when we start to think about completeness and if we actually need all data or most data, that can be a way that we can save time and money and developer resources by saying, okay, this data is good enough and move forward. And the research they're doing and the things that they're implementing on Dataflow are doing that very well. I also know folks that are using the AWS Data Pipeline, which has slightly less functionality, but allows you to still write tasks in Python that are executed in a pipeline format onto AWS. So if you're already using AWS, that might be good. And then there's Azure. So if you're in the Azure cloud, this is essentially the equivalent. Uh, it also has a Python API. So there's tons more. I feel like every time I am at a quote unquote big data conference, Somebody asks me if I've heard of Apache, blah, 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 and I'm like, what is that? Is that a new Apache product that now I have to learn about? Uh, and usually it is. And that's really great. Uh, it's great that Apache is supporting so much of the data uh, open source software, but there are so many different ones. So if you're already using something for this, I would say focus on that. Thankfully, a lot of them, again, are treating Python as this first class citizen in the languages and allowing us to interact uh, with these larger JVM based frameworks. So I decided I was gonna initially do a live, uh, live run of this notebook, but I thought that was probably a bad idea. Um, this is PySpark. I'll again post the code, but essentially I have a tornado server that's ingesting from Twitter and spitting out different events that it's monitoring. I can use PySpark directly in Jupyter Notebooks, which is what's happening here, but I would not recommend running Jupyter Notebooks in production to manage your stream processing. This is just a first use case that you do. Um, and this is just testing things out. And this is also great for your data science team when they're just, ah, I wanna see some of the data that's coming in, I wanna play around with it, I wanna test a new model um, because there's Spark machine learning and so forth. So we here are just doing a very simple word count, which we've all done a million times before if you work with data. And we can import a Spark context, which is already available because of the way that the notebook is run. We can connect to a socket, which is, again, sending tweets. And then we have a DStream object. And this DStream object has some of the abilities to do map and reduce and filter operations. And from there, we move forward. And we can, at the end here, reduce by key. And then we see our computation running here. So again, this is searching for Python. We have some issues with our computation because we're removing stop words. And so we need to add another filter up here. But we can start to see all of the tweets stream in. And again, this is great for if you have stream processing that you need to run. You would never, ever run it in production at a Jupyter Notebook. I cannot say that enough. Um, but this is something you test it out here, and then you deploy it as a Spark application 
then it runs on top of Spark and it does your processing. So maybe it's doing this processing and then maybe you have it feeding into some sort of zeitgeist framework or top trending tweets within Python and so forth. So now that we know how we can automate it, what should we automate? And this is an ongoing battle, right? I'll leave you with another XKCD. I think we're all familiar with this one. And I think we're all familiar with this concept, right? Um, I'm gonna automate this. Uh, this is gonna be really awesome. Look at all the time I'm gonna save. And you find yourself, uh, you know, four weeks later with all of your weekend and evening time working on some sort of new framework that will never probably see the light of day and will have 10 stars on GitHub and took up all of your time. That's fine, that's really great, and I think that we should all continue to experiment and, and think and play with these things, but maybe it's not the best use case for automation. So what can we automate when it comes to an actual data pipeline? And I've thought of a few different things that we should automate. Should definitely automate any pre-processing. There's no way that your data science team should be doing something simple, some simple string processing or some simple schema checking on their endpoint. This should be something that is just a normal part of your production infrastructure and it should be treated as production infrastructure. Repetitive tasks and reports. So if you know every Monday that somebody on the C-level is gonna want their little charts in their CSV, their Excel spreadsheet, then these types of things should all already be developed. Same with basic analytics and dashboards. So if you have a BI system or you have a marketing person or people and they need regular reporting, that should all be automated, right? You should not be wasting engineering resources doing one-off reports or one-off dashboards because somebody wants to see one other data point. This should all be automated and again, as simple as possible. You should try automating as many subtasks as you have. So you might have points of your system where a human has to input some things or validate some things and then move on to the next steps. So try to find places in between there that you can automate. And you should be doing basic data validation. So whether or not you're using static typing, I don't know if I'm gonna get tomatoes thrown at me um, by that, but uh, whether or not you're using static typing, or schema validation, you should be checking things. If absolutely under no circumstances a field should be null, you should have some alerting when the field is null. If absolutely under no circumstances can this data point as an integer be negative, then you should have some alerting on that. Too many times I see teams or work with teams where this validation is checked further down the pipeline on data science ingestion, and at that point in time, it's too late, right? You already have bad data. What are you gonna do? You have to go back, rerun the pipeline. What if you don't have a state-handled pipeline, or what if you didn't have a checkpoint within that time? It can become a real nightmare, and lost data is lost value, usually. So most of the time, the data in your company is one of the biggest points of value that you have. And so this is something that should not be treated as uh, just somebody's pipeline that broke the other day. So if you think that it can't be automated, I challenge you to answer these questions. Have you documented all steps? And by this, I mean I'm gonna be annoying and say that you need to document it every single time. And you might be asking why. And what I say is, other than annoying you and forcing you to automate some things, I want you to really think about if there's patterns in how you handle these things. Because the more time that you can identify patterns in handling and managing them, the more that you can choose to automate even pieces of them. Have you analyzed statistical approaches to your automation? So beyond just saying, okay, if we actually did data normalization earlier in the stage, then we wouldn't run into these skew problems that we're having on this analysis step. It also can be, have you statistically analyzed how your pipeline runs? So when you're documenting and you're going through and you find, hey, I have this invalid type and 80% of the time, it's something simple. It's ingested as a string and I'm expecting a different data type. This is something that you can then automate that piece. You're automating that exception, essentially. Then you still have to manage the 20% of the time that you have to look at the logs, but you should start to think and also work with the data team to decide 
how do we deal, how do we apply statistics to the way that we solve our problems? Have you tried to automate just a piece? Again, automate subtasks, automate small tasks. And have you talked with a teddy bear? So uh, it's like rubber ducking, but I guess the original rubber ducking was with teddy bears. So I am in big favor of bringing teddy bears back into the development cycle. <laughs> So talk with the teddy bear about it. Sometimes a great idea comes up. Oops, forward. So uh, here is a little diagram, and again, I am not a artist, but here's a typical pipeline journey, and I wanted to, at the end, kind of do a takeaway of how are pipelines built and how do we normally think about them and fix them and grow them. Initially, you have an idea, you write a script, or you write a series of DAGs. You move into experimentation and testing and you automate it and you're like, hooray, I'm a genius. This is the best thing that's ever been done. And then that's your server on fire and you're like, holy bleep, this is really difficult. And hopefully you have some really boring alerting and somebody's yelling at you like, Catherine, why did you deploy a bug? Oops, I'm sorry. You go and you do more experimentation and you try to learn more about the problem, right? Um, just because you know a lot about Python or because you know a lot about data doesn't necessarily know about this particular problem. So you do some learning and you do some more experimentation and then you are more, maybe more cautious the next time. You're doing careful automation. You're like, I don't know if this is gonna work. Please don't yell at me. Hopefully I don't set the servers on fire. And then you do plenty of testing, right? By this point in time, you've learned, if not before, that you need to write testing. This is integration testing. This is regression testing. This is profiling your code. This is profiling your code on mirrors of production or as close to production as you can get because just because it works on your box doesn't mean that it works on another box. And then with all of those unit tests and those data validation tests and your integration tests, you move forward with your automation and you can scale and grow and you're scaling and growing and it's mainly working and sometimes the box here or there fails but you've properly set up your infrastructure where when you take down one or two boxes, nobody's gonna come to your desk and spill coffee all over your face. So you keep scaling and growing and you call a cautious victory. And by this it means it's a continual iteration um, but hopefully you've solved some of those major problems. And at the end you usually probably have another idea and likely start again at the beginning. So this is my pipeline journey. I hope that I've given you some ideas of some frameworks and tools to use on your pipeline journey. And I just wanna thank you and thank again PyCon Slovakia for helping me get here. Uh, it was amazing it, to even just arrive and have such great support from the organizers. So I will take questions now. You can also ask me later. And if you wanna talk about any of these topics, I wanna talk about them too. All right, so can we start with the questions? Yeah. All right, so uh, the one with, uh, there's actually a tie, there are four, four questions with the same amount of votes right now. Uh, can you tell about unsuccessful automation? Oh, it's, you yeah, keep yeah, voting now. <laughs> can you t uh, tell about unsuccessful automation you saw or, or participated in? So some, some lessons learned from mistakes in the past. Yeah, so I think that uh, one of the biggest things I've seen recently is automation when it's treated as what I would call a linear scaling problem. So a lot of times with automation, uh, especially with data, we think, okay, I'll just throw more compute at it. And you just keep throwing compute at it and you think that will solve the problem. But if the underlying problem is actually that your jobs are unequally distributed or that there's a bug in your code or something else, this is a problem where, yeah, just throwing more compute at a problem is not gonna solve it. So I think a lot of times we think of automation as, uh, yeah, let's just scale first and we'll figure out the problems later. And I think that this is why I'm a big supporter of a lot of testing and a lot of profiling of the code because if all the servers are on fire, maybe throwing more servers at the servers on fire is a bad idea. Sometimes it's a great idea, 
but sometimes it's a really bad idea and then you just break more servers and then your server bill is like 10,000 just for that month and yeah, somebody gets mad in accounting, of course. So yeah, maybe profiling the problem first. And again, profiling locally, it works on my machine is the worst argument I've ever heard a developer say. So uh, if you say that yourself, and sometimes I have been equally guilty, like, oh, it works fine for me. I don't know what's your problem, production. Uh, so yeah, I would say profile, profile, test, test, uh, and try to find the issues first before you, know, you have production on flames. Thank you. Another one, Luigi versus Airflow. Which one do you personally like more and why? And what other data pipeline tools do you personally like and why? So I think honestly that most Python people are moving to Airflow. I kind of like have a soft spot for Luigi because it was one of the first ones that I used to build a pipeline in Python. But I do think that Airflow honestly uh, is advancing further on the problems that people have. And if you're not already running Yarn or Mesos, then Luigi is probably a little bit overkill to be completely honest. Uh, what other pipeline tools do I like? Um, I'm really falling in love with Apache Flink. Uh, I really ha wish they had more Python support. Because they're in Berlin, I'm going to try to go knock on their door and bother them and just be annoying until they build more Python support. But I think Flink and Apache Beam are tremendously interesting projects and products. And I think that they'll continue to grow. And thankfully, they are thinking about Python. Just maybe they're thinking about it after Java. So. I don't know how to convert them, but I'm trying. If you'd like to elaborate on that one, uh, why is it that, you know, why, why do you find those so interesting? Yeah, so uh, Apache Flink is probably one of the first larger data projects that is streaming first and batching second. So a lot of these infrastructures, people create Lambda pipelines where they feed streaming data and they mirror batching data. And that can, as you can imagine, be really awful decision because you have code running over here and code running over there. And if somebody changes the code or the schema over here, then you have to make sure it's changed over there. So basically, you're maintaining two systems for one pipeline. And Apache Flink is kind of the first one that does streaming first. Um, with watermarking and a whole lot of other different research that's happening on the topic in terms of how do you deal with late arriving data, how do you deal with properly windowing your data, how do you deal with real-time quote-unquote machine learning, and other things like that. So I think that they're just working on really interesting problems and yeah, I'm gonna push on them to have more Python. <laughs> awesome. In an Airflow, do you have in production just one instance of Airflow schedule running and how do you protect Airflow cluster? from scheduler outage? Yeah, again, so Airflow can run as a single scheduler, but it also primarily uses Celery as a scheduler. So you can run the Airflow scheduler the same way that you would run a distributed Celery instance. So it's going to use Celery to determine when jobs need to be redone or retested. It's gonna just uh, treat that as a, almost a completely separate system just there to manage the scheduling for you. So you don't need to, again, have it as one singular point of failure. Um, I would imagine that you probably want at least two nodes, but they should be talking to one another, of course, and they should be properly attached to all of the different partitioned or distributed data that you have. The, the main thing that you have to start to think about there is actually network failure and overloading your network because you're moving, you know, because you decided to scale linearly and throw up five new machines and then you're trying to move 20 gigs across your network at once and that's an awful idea. So don't do that. Okay, and we'll take one more. Um, how do you install task dependencies or packages on Airflow workers? Is there some sort of Docker integration? So I'm, I'm certain that there's probably a Docker image that does this by now. I haven't used Docker to do this. I primarily uh, use Ansible to deploy um, automatically, but I know Docker's the new thing and I'm trying to be in favor of it. So I'm fairly certain there's probably a Docker image to do this, but Airflow essentially manages that from the central schedulers. And then at that point in time, you can actually ask for refreshes and it will go ask for the latest code and then execute that code within the workers. Uh, we'll skip the next three questions so we have uh, a chance to have a little break and, 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 and stretch, our, stretch our bones, stretch ourselves. Uh, so I'm, I don't know if, if you're happy to take more questions personally in the hallway. Of course. Um, awesome. So thank you once again, Katarina. And, um,